Um, that company declined to build their track here. I think they decided to put it in West Virginia of all places. Um, so at the moment, it looks like that project is, is more or less dead here in the state. Any other questions for our representative as he visits with us right now? Allow me to ask you another question as we wait about, specifically about, um, obviously you're not from Texas, so let's talk about abortion in Missouri. Uh, under, I think this was before you took office, Missouri passed a heartbeat yeah. bill. House Bill 126 was what the name of it. What is a heartbeat bill and what's your general take on it? So, broadly speaking, what a heartbeat bill does is it says that abortions will be illegal in the state after a heartbeat is detected. After a fetal heartbeat is detected, you can't go in and commit an abortion on that, on that baby. That will be considered a crime. So, uh, that bill got passed two or three years ago now and is currently uh, tied up in the court system. Um, I think it's at the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals right now, actually. There has been some arguments on it in just the past couple weeks. Um, so that's, that's, what it, that's generally what that is and currently what the status is. So it's a little bit different than the, the Texas bill where it basically says any citizen in the state can go and sue a b abortion provider. Um, this one provides the more traditional route where the state is saying that that will be a criminal activity. Uh, what about the prescription drug monitoring? This is something that got passed actually pretty recently. Uh, we had uh, a lot of questions about it. What, is, what was your vote on this issue? How do you feel about it? First of all, what is it, sir, and then? Yeah, so basically a prescription drug monitoring program is a program that is sort of operated by the government that um, individual medical providers are able to put data into this database that tracks their patients' prescriptions. And specifically, um, the idea was to really track the pain prescriptions in an attempt to resolve a, or help with the opioid crisis that we see in the state. So that way, you wouldn't be able to have patients who can just go from medical provider to medical provider getting pain pills and uh, the doctors didn't know that this was happening. That's basically the idea behind it. Um, it did, it, it passed uh, this past session, actually. Um, and this is something that's been debated in the state for, I think, a decade or more. We are the last state in the country to pass it. Um, I voted no on it. I had some concerns with, the, uh, with how broad it was it, it, because the, the language of the bill wasn't just tailored to um, paying prescriptions, which was really what we were concerned about. It was kind of all prescriptions, and I didn't really think that every individual's prescription should go in a, in a government database. I had some concerns about that. Um, there were some other concerns that I had too and, and that caused me to vote no, but it, it was really kind of the, the over broadness of it um, that, that caused me to, to vote no. But um, it did pass. It's now uh, the law of the land and we're the last state in the country that adopted it. Policy-wise or your job-wise? We'll leave you on this. Policy-wise... There, there is one question. Oh, go ahead, actually. If you want me to take that. Yeah, please. Um, I was wondering on... Um, I don't know if they're like RDR actually, but I was wondering if there's like a program that they could do Yeah, so that's actually a good question. Kind of brings me back to what I was talking about there at the very beginning before we started taking questions. Was um, we do there? There are a lot of programs in place already that are working there at, uh, with that population. But that's one of the things that I've been able to work on personally and have had some personal success on in my first session is providing some funding for some of our nonprofits in Springfield who are specifically working with those populations. So there's, uh, for, for an example, there's one group here in Springfield called the Drew Lewis Foundation that does a lot of work with those populations and is basically kind of a whole mentoring process where they walk alongside them every step of the way. They help them find housing. They, they help them find jobs, things like that. Um, so I was able to put almost a million dollars in the budget for 
both that organization and kind of a sister organization that works with them that's specifically targeted to helping um, low-income individuals and specifically um, women and minorities get into the tech field. Um, so there are some things in place. There are more things that we're working on and putting in place, and, that, and, and frankly, that's one of my, my personal passions uh, of the things that I've personally been working on. So uh, policy-wise or your job-wise, what's something about your daily life as a representative that uh, we should know more about? If you, if you had your druthers, what, which we know more about, you, your position, or politics in general in state? So, you know, again, it really goes to my, my personal passion is economics and helping people in, in whatever it looks like to them find success economically. So that, that doesn't mean everyone needs to be millionaires, but it does mean that people should be able to find whatever economic opportunity that provides a meaningful life to them. So, you know, at the state level, with some of the bills that I file, they're, they're more broadly trying to help make our state's business climate more favorable, help us be able to compete to bring in better jobs. And then with my role in the budget committee, like what I've talked about, really focusing on, on providing funding for our, our area nonprofits who are doing some great work in, in the space, especially with our homeless populations and things of that nature. Budget committee is a tough assignment. It is. It's a yep. massive amount of work. That's right. So we've got a, about a $35 billion budget in the state. Um, and, and for those of us on the budget committee, most of our time in the Capitol is spent actually working on the budget. There's a couple more questions. So I had a question back on the, on the abortion with the heartbeat. Um, is there any exceptions to that, um, like if it's non-consensual? <coughs> And if there isn't, like, what is your take on that for, like, as a woman having rights for that? My recollection is the, there is a life of the mother exception in the bill that Missouri passed. Um, there, there isn't a rape exception in that bill to my recollection. And I think that the thought there, and, and you may agree or disagree with this, is as, as policymakers, if you think that abortion is the taking of a human life, then um, the, the only time that that would be um, really okay is if there's also another human life that could be lost if that procedure wasn't performed. So I think that was the idea behind only having the one exception in their place. Um, what's your take on raising the minimum wage? So, I have a lot of concerns over raising the minimum wage. Um, I, we'll kind of see how it all shakes out with where we're at currently, where we have this situation where um, companies are raising their own wages above the minimum wage right now to, in, in order to try and bring more workers back into the workforce. Um, but before kind of the current situation that we're in now, the concern that I was hearing from a lot of the especially the small businesses, was we're not going to be able to, we're, we're, it just doesn't make economic sense. We don't have the dollars to be able to pay these new wages that the government is saying we have to pay. But you did have all the big companies like Walmart and Target and things like that all advocating for the minimum wage increase because they did have the financial resources and they knew that if those laws went into place, that could potentially cause a lot of their competition to go under. Um, we'll see kind of how it all plays out. So the state's minimum wage has, it did get raised, um, and it's on an upward trajectory. I can't remember what it ultimately ends at, but. Add to that, like, if we were to raise, to raise, sorry, to raise minimum wage, do you think it could help with like, the poverty line, like where we're at, if we raise it higher than that? So working minimum wage, you kind of live Paycheck to paycheck, making like minimum, like exactly to where you need to be. But I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it, no, it does. So the, the issue there for policymakers is is the risk of the job uh, of the number of jobs lost that you're going to have because of the minimum wage increase. Is that worth the potential ability to bring a certain population? up a little bit and and when you look at the data it's really 
it's there, there's not great data that really shows what the answer is. You, you see data that says both things. You see some places that, some data that says, if you raise the minimum wage, you're just, just gonna lose thousands and thousands of jobs. You see other data that says, um, there's not really a major job decline when that happens. Um, so as, as policymakers, you have to weigh that conflicting data. Um, I think now, what we're seeing is the market is raising its own wage in an attempt to bring people into the workforce. So I think that we as policymakers should step back, especially right now, not tinker with those wages by creating you know, artificial limits um, and, and let that market kind of raise itself in order to compete and bring workers off the sidelines back into the workforce. And that's what we're seeing now and it's, and it's working. Um, we've seen wages here in Springfield increase dramatically in just the few, past few months, and I think that will continue across the state and country um, over the coming months as more businesses are competing for that, that smaller workforce pool. So instead of like having um, a set minimum wage that like the government or each state, I guess, because it's different by each state, the minimum wage gives, it would be easier to just let the business itself raise the so I, there's a downfall to like small businesses not being able to pay the workers Yeah, so that, I mean, that's my personal preference because I think, you know, every individual in this room, if you're deciding where you're going to work, wages are certainly going to be one of those things that you decide. It's not necessarily the end-all be-all, but it's one of the things that helps you make your decision. So if you've got, you know, one company, if, if Walmart's going to pay you 15 bucks an hour to go work there, but you know, Bob and Jane's bookshop on the corner is only gonna pay you 850. You might go work at Walmart just because you're gonna make more there. So I think that those market forces uh, were kind of, um, they kind of help resolve that situation sort of naturally. And then if Bob and Jane's bookshop can't recruit anyone to come work for them and they really feel like they need an employer or an employee, then they may have to raise those wages in order to recruit someone. So that's my preferred, um, that's my preferred way to do that. I, I certainly don't like a federal, especially a high federal minimum wage, because that just does not take into account the unique differences between states. So if you're in California, I mean, a 15, 20, maybe 20, $25 minimum wage makes a lot of sense. Like you can't live in California yeah, for that. But if you're in Springfield, $15 minimum wage, maybe that does make sense. We have a low cost of living. So um, if, if kind of broadly speaking, I don't think that the federal government should really start raising minimum wages, especially to a high level, because it really doesn't take into account the individual unique e economic situations in the states. Yeah, everything's different. You mentioned a couple things throughout the presentation so far, and one of them was, um, this is a very ideological question. So uh, one of them was taxes and, and the other was limited government. I wanted to know, do you think ideologically it's uh, fair to tax the wealthy individuals in society more than other individuals like middle class or low? Well, I, my personal preference would be to have a, what's called a flat tax, where you have every, every population paying basically the same rate. Um, that's, I think, that, that's my preference. Um, if you're looking at like an income tax as a whole, really, I, I'm not a big fan of the income tax at all. I would, I would like to see the income tax get abolished in Missouri and move to um, just a higher sales tax. Because I do think that would be a, I think you do have an, an, an equitable situation there because you have your wealth, your populations are gonna buy more crap. So they're gonna pay more taxes versus your lower income populations won't be buying as much, they won't have as high of a tax burden. So I think if you're looking at um, what, what I would consider the most equitable result, it would be something like that. Any other questions? All right, round of applause for our guest speaker. Before, <laughs> best way to contact you, sir? Uh, there are a number of ways. I'll give you my personal cell phone. That's the best way to do okay. it. 
It's uh, 417-860-7555. One more time, sir. 417-860-7555. That's my personal cell phone. Best way to contact me, but you can email me through my official house email. You can find that online. You can call my office. You can find my law firm information online. You can get in touch with me there too. I'm, I'm pretty accessible, so um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out and ask. If you think I'm doing something dumb up there, don't hesitate to tell me that either. Um, but yeah, that number of ways to get in touch with me. All right, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.